His fullness of joy. In Your presence is the new wine and oil, and in Your presence is where I long to be. Father, draw me, draw me near to where you are. For you are holy, so holy, and I worship before you now. Lord, you are holy. So holy, Spirit of God, breathe on us now. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your presence is the new wine and oil and e e Your presence is where I long to be. Father, draw me, draw me near to where you are. Draw me near to where you are. Draw me near. call to worship. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kidshanu bimitzvotav vitzivanu vishmo kol shofar Amen Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments and instructed us to hear the voice of the shofar. Amen. Shalom, y'all. Oh, we're going to do that again. Shalom, y'all. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us in your word and given us Yeshua, our Messiah, and commanded us to be a light to the world. Amen. Baruchat Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Bore peri hagafen, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai, 
Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechem miharetz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Um, I was uh, reminded that uh, silence is actually the highest form of praise. Avi, uh, of course, I'm going to be making sounds come out of my mouth as I pray, but really silence is the highest, highest form of praise because when all of our speaking and everything's done, all we can do is just be silent before you because there's nothing really that we can say or sing or do or anything that, that can actually be descriptive of you because you're so awesome and just beyond all that. So... Anyway, uh, just uh, thank you for Shabbat. Thank you for making a space. Thank you for the things that aren't here so that we can just be in silence sometimes, so that we can just be in the space that you've created for us and just dwell in your presence. So help us in our endeavors here just to dwell in your presence. And we thank you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. How are you? Half of you are okay, the other half I'm not so sure about. It's sure good to see you. I'm glad that you're here. My name's Hubie Shore. I'm one of the elders here. And we have several other elders. We have Gary Swearingen. Where is Jeff Knobloch? Right here. Ray, you're one of the elders. And then Dennis Headkey at the back. I was reminded I'm not the only elder. There's three others. So... Glad you're here. I'm glad that we can meet together and we can raise our hands and, and praise the Lord. Um, are there any announcements? Well, Josh Sattel's up there, but I don't think I need to introduce him. I, I will say that we are still taking donations for the Torah Fund. If you would like to give, we, we are going to purchase a safer Torah. We're about halfway there. And uh, we'll try to get those numbers to you, but continue to give. We're, we're going to have our own Torah, and uh, we'll have a, a service, and it'll be a very, very special time. Let's continue to worship Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shabbat, Shabbat Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shabbat, Shabbat Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom. Am Israel, Am Israel, Am Israel Chai, Am Israel, Am Israel, Am Israel Chai, Am Israel, Am Israel, Am Israel Chai. Amisrael, 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 O David, O Chai, 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 O David, O Chai,
Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Praise the Lord. I'm going to have the adults sit. Children, would you stand with me? And we adults want to bless you. We're going to stretch your hands out, symbolic of a covering for each and every child here tonight. The Sabbath prayer. Shamru, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, in it you shall not do any work. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Speak also unto the children of Israel, saying, Above all my Sabbath you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Amen.
Let's bless some Messiah Yeshua together, shall we? The English first. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way to salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher natan lanu haderek leshua, Bimashiach Yeshua. Amen. Psalm 27, remember, I've encouraged you to read it twice a day during the month of Elul. We're going to read it together tonight, and I think there's six pages, so are you ready? Let's read together. Adonai is my light and salvation. Whom do I need to fear? Adonai is the stronghold of my life. Of whom should I be afraid? When evil doers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they stumbled and fell. If an army encamps against me, my heart will not fear. If war breaks out against me, even then I will keep trusting. Just one thing I have asked of Adonai, only this will I seek, to live in the house of Adonai all the days of my life, to see the beauty of Adonai and visit in his holy temple. For he will conceal me in his shelter on the day of trouble. He will hide me in the folds of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Then my head will be lifted up above my surrounding foes, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with the shouts of joy. I will sing, sing praises to Adonai. Listen, Adonai, to my voice when I cry. Show favor to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek my face, your face, Adonai, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Don't turn your servant away in anger. You are my help. Don't abandon me. Don't leave me, God my Savior. Even though my father and mother have left me, Adonai will care for me. Teach me your way, Adonai. Lead on level path because of my enemies. Don't give me up to the whims of my foes. For false witnesses have risen against me, also those who are breathing violence. If I hadn't believed that I would see Adonai's goodness in the land of the living, put your hope in Adonai. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, put your hope in Adonai. Can I get an amen? Somebody help me out. Praise the Lord. If you'd like to stand, we would invite you to do so if you can. And we're going to sing about Adonai. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord my God is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. For the Lord my God is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. La, 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 la.
confession, though Yeshua existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Yeshua, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth. And that every tongue will confess that Yeshua, amen. Again, Yeshua, the Messiah, is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, amen and amen. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Malchuto Le'olam Vaed, Yeshua HaMashiach Hu HaAdon Yeshua HaMashiach Hu HaAdon Yeshua the Messiah, He is the Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is the name of His glorious kingdom for all eternity. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And have these words, which I command you this day, be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. And speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you tire, and when you arise. Frontless between your eyes, you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. V'hafta l'areacha kamocha, and you should. Amen. If you please, would please remain standing tonight, we will say Kaddish in memory of Christopher Lang. This is uh, the husband of Cindy and Stan Davies' niece. He died unexpectedly two weeks ago, very tragic. Um, fell off a roof trimming trees at his home. And uh, it's been very devastating, very difficult for the family. So we will say Kaddish tonight in his memory. The English first. Magnified and sanctified be his great name, which, which he has created according to his will. May his kingdom be established during your life and during your days and during the life of the whole house of Israel, even swiftly and soon, and say, Amen. Let his great be blessed forever and to all eternity. Blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified and lauded be the name of the Holy One, Blessed is he, though he be high above all the blessings and songs, praises and consolations which are uttered in the world, and say amen. 
May he who makes peace in Israel make peace upon us and upon all of Israel and say, Amen. Yit gadol veyit kadash shemay raba bil madivra churate v'yamlik malchute b'chaye chon uv'yomay chon uv'chaye de kol beit Yisrael bagala bagala uv'izman kari. Vemru Amen. Yeshme Rabba Mivarach. Leol Am Ual Me Almaya. Yit Barach. Yit Barach. Ve Ishtabach. Ve Yit Par. Ve Yit Romam. Ve Yit Nase. Ve Yit Hadar. Ve Yit Hale. Ve Yit Halal. Shme Dekudsha. Brichu leela min ko bechata vishirata tush bechata vinechemata damiran belma vemru amen. O say shalom bimromab, who ya say shalom alenu, vea ko Yisrael vemru amen. May he who makes peace in his high places make peace upon us and upon all of Israel. And the congregation said, Amen. Amen. We invite you to dance a whore, but if you don't want to dance a whore, you can sit, you can stand, whatever God leads you to do. Come, house of Jacob, let us walk in blood. 
Let's go. 
the Torah that you pay respect to the Torah either with your talus or your Bible or your sador and uh, touch your heart somewhere in here just so that we can be safe and I will bring um, the Torah to you. When the ark would travel, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered and let them that hate you flee from you. For from Zion will go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people. By a heaven so Oh, oh, oh. 
a blessing before reading from Torah. Baruchu er Adonai Hamvorach. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Le'olam Vaed. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam. Asher Natan Lanu Torat Emet Bechaye Olam Natan Betochenu. Baruch Ata Adonai No Ten Hatorah. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Tonight I'll be chanting from the portion Kitavo, um, Deuteronomy 26 and verse 1. Ve'aha ki el aharetz asher Adonai Elohecha noten lecha nakala ve'ishtaha ve'yashav tabach. And for the blessing after. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher natan lano torat emet vechaye olam natan betochenu baruch ata Adonai no ten haTorah. And the English. Amen. For the English, I'll be reading in Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 11. When you have entered the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance and have taken possession of it and settled in it, take some of the first fruits of all you produce from the soil of the land that you, the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket. Then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name and say to the priest in the office at the time, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. The priest shall take the basket from your hands, set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Armenian, and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and outstretched arm, with a great terror and with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, Lord, have given me. Place the basket before the Lord your God and bow down before him. Then you and the Levites and the foreigners residing among you shall rejoice in all the good things that the Lord your God has given you and your household. <clears throat> For the half Torah reading, I will be reading Isaiah 60, 1 through 3, and verses 15 through 22. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Although you, although you have been forsaken and hated, with no one traveling through, I will make you the everlasting pride and the joy of all generations. You will drink the milk of the nations and be nursed at royal breasts. Then you will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. The sun will no more be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. Then all your people will will be righteous, and they will possess the land forever. Amen. They are the shoot I have planted, the work of my hands, for the display of my splendor. The least of you will become a thousand, and the smallest a mighty nation. I am the Lord. 
It is time. I will do this swiftly. Amen. And for the Brit Hadashah, the apostolic writing, I will be reading Matthew 13, verses 18 through 23. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the world, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word but worries of his life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what is sown. Shabbat shalom. I think we have a bunch of good soil in this congregation. What do you think? You, you producing a good crop? Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, listen, I want to say thank you to the elders and, and to Jeff for teaching for me uh, last week and uh, you guys allowing us to take a few days and recuperate. As much as I love Colorado, in fact, I even suggested to Patty we try to talk you guys into moving out there. We couldn't wait to get home. So thank you so much to, to everyone who helped um, continue our services, even if we're not here. And, and that's the sign of a wonderful congregation. Um, you, we may miss a part here and there, but this thing marches on, right? Despite me <laughs> sometimes. So thank you very much. You are appreciated. Two weeks. What's in two weeks? Our Shoshana, the Feast of Trumpets. Can you believe it? Uh, we were in Colorado, and I saw the full moon, and I was talking to my friend, Marty, and I said, Marty, two weeks. We're at the middle of the month, two weeks. The moon will disappear. Rosh Hashanah always falls on a new moon, the day that nobody knows, the day that uh, the Apostle Paul talked about. Um, so I'm so excited to, to be ushered into the High Holy Days. So Erev Shabbat, which is Friday evening, September 18th, in this room at 7 o'clock p.m. and then the next day on Shabbat Saturday, 3 o'clock p.m. in this room. We need lots of hands, um, lots of help sitting up and tearing down. And then immediately following the service, we will go to North Chisholm Creek Park for a short Tashlik service, and we invite you to join us. Um, so I just pray that you are prepared or you're preparing to meet with Hashem in repentance um, in humility in this very special time of the year as we look forward to the Day of Atonement and to Sukkot Tabernacles when we can rejoice. Okay, having said all that, I want to get back to our study in Romans. Um, I hope you're enjoying this study as much as I am enjoying preparing. Um, we always learn something, I hope. So I want to spend a few minutes for context and for getting everybody back on the same page spend a few minutes and reconnect with our last lesson. If you remember two weeks ago, um, we begin to ex examine Romans chapter 7. And in that chapter, Paul right away introduced his marriage metaphor, his analogy. And he said this, Romans chapter 7 verse 1, Or do you not know, brothers and sisters, and he says, I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is master over a person as long as he lives. And I had several of you ask me, well, you know, I never understood it the way that you, you introduced it or explained it, but what law? Well, he's talking about the law of marriage. And well, how do we know? Because Paul tells us exactly what he's talking about in the very next verse where he says, for the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if the husband dies, she is released from the law concerning 
the husband. So right here, Paul tells us what he's talking about. And so grammatically speaking, everything that follows is connected to this. So everything that he's going to talk about, he connects it to this marriage metaphor, okay? He's referring to the law of marriage. Now, the other lesson that Paul has sown into this analogy is that death releases a human being from the Torah, which makes sense, right? Because when you die, you're nothing. You can neither keep the Torah nor can you break the Torah. Once you've died, you can't keep Torah any longer. Death frees you from any obligation to the Torah. And by the way, there are no commandments in the Bible for the dead concerning the Torah. They're not there, all right? So as the woman in the metaphor is released from the marriage of her first husband through the death of that husband and free to marry another, we too have been released from, hear me, from the condemnation of the Torah, not the Torah itself. Do you hear me? Give me an amen. You got to do better. I'm going to expect a lot out of you because we're 17, 18 lessons into this class. I want an amen. Uh, praise the Lord. Thank you. Not the Torah, but the punishment of the Torah. How? Because we died with the Messiah. We died to our old sin master. We died to our old life of slavery. We died to our old sinful first husband. And now we are free to join ourselves to the Messiah. It is often taught, I hear it all the time, that the Torah was nailed to the stake of Messiah. Have you heard that? No, no, no. The Bible very clearly says the penalty, the punishment for breaking the Torah, Messiah took in his flesh for you. That's what the Bible says. Okay. And by the way, here's something I didn't bring out over the weeks, but I'm going to tonight. Until we were free of that sinful first marriage, Messiah would not marry us. You know why? Of all the obvious reasons, but you know why? Because he obeys his own rules. That would be adultery. <laughs> you kind of get God, right? He's... So the first husband had to die. We died in that mikvaot. And we're free to remarry. In the same way, becoming the, the, the disciples and the followers of Yeshua, we are now following the new covenant. It's part of this expression. It doesn't free us from the commandments of Torah. Right? We still have the thou shalt nots, right? No, we're free from the consequences of breaking those commandments. The law remains, but our master changes. Okay? And in verse 5 of chapter 7, Paul says that we were once married to the flesh, and he simply means our humanness, our human body. In other words, we couldn't say no to sin. Our master was the flesh. We were weak. Paul says, for when we were in the flesh, in the body, the sinful passions that came through the Torah were working in our body parts to bear fruit for death. Now, as translations go, this is okay, but we can do better. Dr. Dan Gruber wrote, it should have been rendered thus. He says, for when we were in the flesh, the painful consequences of sin defined by the law worked in the members of the body to bring forth the fruit of death. And I like that better. Okay? Our errant behavior before coming to Messiah Yeshua produced a poisonous fruit that led to death. Not any longer. If you've joined yourself to the Messiah, we've died to our flesh, we have a new master, we no longer belong to that sinful first husband, do we? We're sinners here, we go through the mikvah, we come up a brand new creature. Can I get an amen? Praise the Lord. Paul says we died with the Messiah. And Paul says we were raised with the Messiah, our new master. We are in Messiah, and he is in us. And now the fruit of this new union produces righteousness. It's a good fruit. And my friends, in Messiah there is no sin. And if he is in you, you now have the power to say no to sin. Right? Just remind yourself, I'm dead. 
I shouldn't sin. I'm dead. We can say no to sin. Romans chapter 7, verse 6, Paul says, Now we have been released from the law. What law is Paul talking about? The same law he began the chapter with. Is it the law of Moses? Is it the Torah? You guys should know this. No. It's that old first marriage, the constraints of that old sinful marriage, the penalty for breaking the law. Paul says, we have died to what confined us so that we now serve in the new way of the Ruach, the spirit, and not in the old way of the letter. That's clumsy, and it can bit mislead. Because some translations say um, the old written code, or the oldness of the letter, or that old law code, Ugh, right? And they create this artificial tension between grace and the law. And if we read it and we understand it like that old law code, it makes it impossible to, ins to escape the implication that Paul is referencing the Old Testament. You know, we don't follow those old rules any longer because now we're led by the Spirit, right? I know you've been taught that. <laughs> but remember, I brought up the point, another way of saying letter is what? Who knows? Ketuba, say it with me. Ketuba. What is a ketuba? It's a marriage contract. Some of you have beautiful ketubas hanging on your walls at home. Okay? Ketuba. It's a marriage contract between the husband and the wife, which is the unambiguous subject of the entire analogy, marriage. So we could say not in the old way of the ketuba, which prevented us from escaping this sinful marriage, the old way, the enslavement of the flesh, not the Torah, our flesh. The new way, now that we've escaped that, we, we have chosen a new master, we're married to a new husband, now we have the Spirit to lead us. Okay, are we kind of good? Yeah? I keep emphasizing these things because I want you guys to get them in your kepi a hundred times, okay? I'm, I'm well on the way, right? Okay, good. I am convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that Paul knew he would be misunderstood 1,800 years ago, 1,900 years ago. He knew his words would be misrepresented. Because look at what he says next. He begins with a false premise. Now, we ought to be familiar with a false premise, right? Whenever we hear, what shall we say then? What's coming next? A false premise. Paul says, what shall we say then? Because I know what you're thinking. Is the Torah sin? Somebody was spreading the rumor. Paul says, may it never be. Then he says, on the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the what? The Torah. For I would not have known about coveting if the Torah had not said, you shall not covet. Again, friends, Paul knew what you would be thinking. He knew most of us would be disoriented by his words. He's saying, he is saying essentially, do not think for a minute that I'm saying the Torah is sin and therefore to be done away with. You see, we think this is kind of a, a, a new problem. Paul was dealing with it in his day. That's why Peter said, that's one tough dude to understand. They were struggling with this. And the very mistaken conclusion that this declaration is fighting against is the very conclusion that most of the church has come to, has settled on. That the Torah is a liability in the life of the believer. Now, I want to read to you a quote from a very prominent pastor in America who has tens of thousands of members. And if I said his name, you would know him, but I'm not going to do that. It's not fair to him. All right? And I want to read you this quote because it betrays his feelings about the Torah. And I'm quoting. I think we're going to have it on the screen. First century church leaders unhitched the church from the worldview, the value system, and the regulations of the Jewish scriptures. And my blood pressure goes up 10 points every time I read this. Just saying. Continuing, he added, Peter, James, 
and Paul elected to unhitch the Christian faith from their Jewish scriptures. And my friends, you should do the same thing, he says. Whew, take a breath. That's one gnarled up statement. I mean, there's so much fodder for comment, and I don't want to get negative, but I could attack this six ways from Sabbath, and we could have six more lessons. I, it, it really hurts me. <laughs> it's sad. And my point is that because of these kinds of notions, these verses, this verse especially in Romans has been terribly misunderstood for thousands of years. Clearly Paul teaches that the Torah is good and valuable and very much needed in the life of the believer. If not for the Torah, says Paul, I would not have known that coveting was wrong. The Torah tells us we are sinners. And you know what? Our conscience confirms it <laughs> in, that, in that little voice in your heart. You know. I got a question. Is it bad? Is it a negative thing that the Torah tells us we've missed the mark, that we're sinners? Is that a bad thing on any level? The answer is no. Is that somehow a liability for us? Is that something that we should be unhitched from? I betray my passion. Forgive me. <laughs> if we are unhitched from the Jewish scriptures, and I think this pastor means the Torah, the Tanakh, I don't know. Hear me, I'm not being glib then is it okay to marry your father's wife? Because the Torah says you should not do that. Is it okay to marry your father's daughter? Because the Torah says you shouldn't do that. I can go on and on. What's okay and what's not okay? And again, I'm not being a smart aleck, but you know that the idea is, well, we're under grace. Wink, wink. If we are to unhitch from the value system of the Jewish scriptures, that means to me we become lawless. Torahlessness equals lawlessness. There's no way around it. And by the way, I know I've done this. I hear it all the time. We make this distinction for context, for clarity. We say that the Tanakh are the Jewish scriptures, and that the New Testament, the apostolic writings, are the Christian scriptures. Hear me, every single book in the Bible was written by a Jewish person. Dr. Luke converted to Judaism, in my opinion. Every single book. And in many respects, the New Testament is more Jewish than the old one. We talk about you know, the, 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 the arbitrary 613 laws that we find in the, in the Torah. You start counting in the New Testament, you'll get a headache. There's a whole lot more. It's one book. It is seamless. It starts in Genesis and it ends in Revelation. And it's a, talking about the same God. It's His revelation to us. And we should pay attention, I think. It's all one book. So if you hear me say the Jewish scripture, sometimes I say that for context, but that's not what's going on here. And maybe I'm letting my hair down, but my heart hurts because the one common denominator in that quote is, anything Jewish should be done away with. That's how I see it. And I wonder why. Well, I digress, kind of. Verse 8, Paul says, But sin, taking an opportunity, worked in me through the commandments, all kinds of coveting. For apart from the Torah, and I'm going to define the Torah as the righteous standard spelled out in the law. That's what it is, among other things. Sin is dead. 
But I want to get to the next two verses because they are difficult to understand. You can really get sideways here. Chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, Paul says, Once I was alive apart from the Torah. Hmm. But the commandment came in. But when the commandment came in, sin came to life. The Greek says, almost sprang to life. And I died. The commandment that was meant for life was found to cause death. Rabbit trail. This gives me time to cool off, too. <laughs> How many commandments did Adam and Eve have? Spelled out commandments. You know, the, the 613 is kind of arbitrary, but depending on what, what stream of Judaism, you could have less. <laughs> but 613 is kind of accepted. They had one commandment. Do not eat of the tree, the fruit of the tree of good and evil of knowledge, right? Our parents couldn't get one commandment right. We've got 613. I get scared sometimes. I, I get it. A third of those can't be followed because there's no more temple. But there's another tree in the garden, wasn't there? The tree of eternity, I'll just paraphrase. How come they didn't eat from that? In fact, I can imagine God saying, take two, take three. We went to the wrong tree. Genesis chapter 2, and then he had to put <laughs> guards around the tree. Because you see, if our parents had have eaten from the tree of eternity before there was a way to, of salvation, they would have lived in a perpetual state of sin. That's a gracious God. It's a very gracious God. Wow. All right. Paul says, I was once alive apart from the law. I think that's a strange comment. I, I find that strange. When was Paul ever apart from the law? I want you to think about it. He was always under the law, except for the first seven days of his life. And I'm going to explain that. His parents were Jewish, and they brought him under the law on the eighth day. It's called a bris, or a circumcision. I've had the pleasure to do many of your sons. That is so fun for me. And part of the ceremony, I play the part of the moil, but I don't do the actual part. The moil is the guy that does the circumcision. Um, but I, I read some parts in there, and one of these are, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commandments and commanded us to enter into the covenant of Abraham our father. And then all in attendance reply, Just as he entered into a covenant, the covenant, so may he enter into Torah, into marriage and good deeds. You see, at that point in the bris, you've been brought into this covenant you're part of this nation. So what is Paul driving at? Once I was apart from the law. Can I tell you what I think he meant? I believe, believe he's referring to that time before his bar mitzvah. Bar son mitzvah commandment. Okay, before he became a son of the commandments. The time before he was accountable to the Torah. And Judaism has decided that it's 12 years for a female, bat mitzvah, daughter of the commandments, and 13 years for boys. That's kind of arbitrary, too, because there are 10-year-olds who know that they're sinning against God. And then there are 30-year-olds who have never figured it out. So God gets to decide those things, but this is a general idea, 12 and 13. I have an example for you. All right. Certain laws and guidelines do not apply to children because, well, they're underage. What do they know from the rules of our society, right? What do they know? They have no basis for understanding. So they are not governed by these ordinances. A four-year-old child does not know what the speed limit is 
or a parking stall or any of these moving traffic violations. And the law doesn't apply to them, right? I have a four-year-old granddaughter. She has captured my heart, let me tell you. And you can probably say the same thing, right? Well, I got a, 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 a video. And um, her dad and mom will kind of go out in the country and just drive around as most of us do. And um, he had Harper standing right in his lap. And they're going like one mile an hour. And he's got, it was safe, this is safe. He's got his hands on the steering wheel. And that little girl's got her hands on the steering wheel and she is going east to west, wham, wham, wham. And she says, Daddy, we gotta get to the cows. Down through the ditch, over the fence, into the field. And her dad said, of course, well, no, you can't do that. What does she know? She wanted to get to the cows, right? Okay. It's a great video. However, there's going to come a time when that little girl will come under the driving laws of the state of Kansas. She'll get a learner's permit. Hopefully, she will graduate to a full-fledged permit. Now the speed limit matters. It makes a big difference in her life, well, because she's of the age where the laws of Kansas govern her driving. At four, there was no such law. It didn't apply. Later in life, it very much does apply, doesn't it? You are now under the laws of Kansas. You're of the age of driving accountability. In the same way, before the age of accountability, it is my opinion our sins were not held against us. And only God knows what that age is. And Paul is saying as much. But when the age came in, the age that I was accountable, and I'm suggesting his bar mitzvah, sin sprang to life and I died. Why did I die? Because I was a sinner. I sinned. And the very commandment, do not covenant, that was meant to bring me life, only brought me death. I think that's right. I hope it's right. <laughs> In Romans chapter 7, verses 11 and 12, Paul said, Sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. Those are powerful words. The commandment not to covet killed me because I was guilty. Those are graphic words. Paul says, sin used the law against me and it killed me. Sin does that. Sin uses the law against us. What Paul says, Paul says sin uses the Torah. It takes all of the thou shalt nots and turn the, turns them into yes you shall. And it drags us into sin. It's the forbidden fruit syndrome, right? <laughs> Our parents knew about that. Once you pro prohibit something, it becomes the most desirable thing in the world, and you can't live without it. I got to have it. I mean, why do you think self-control is so difficult? <laughs> right? Especially when you're trying to break a habit or some addictive habit. But you can't eat just one. So once again... Paul says, please don't misunderstand me. Don't get me wrong. Hear what I am saying. Listen. The Torah is holy. <laughs> the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Remember, Torah means what? Instruction. It's incorrect to say the Torah means law because the Torah has many things in it, including laws. But the Torah can be defined very narrowly, the five books of Moses, or it can be used to define the entire Bible because instruction is everywhere in the Bible. God's instruction is holy. Can I get an amen? God's commandment is holy. Give me an amen. God's commandment is righteous. God's commandment is good. All of God's Torah is holy, not parts, but all. You see, the Torah makes us aware the Torah is good and it always has been good. It is what it is. 
It's the person, it's us, who produces a response in the Torah. If one reads and follows and embraces the Torah, then you find righteousness and goodness. If you study the Torah and you find the Messiah and you make him your master, then that response produces life. However, if you miss the goal of the Torah, and let's be clear, the goal of the Torah is solely Yeshua, Jesus. That's the goal of the Torah, period. That's why when we parade the Torah around, we're lifting up Messiah. He's the goal of the Torah. But if you miss the goal of the Torah, if you don't find the Messiah, if you don't make him your master, you remain in the flesh, says Paul. And your response is going to be very self-centered and very selfish. You will miss the mark. The mark is the goal. The mark is the Messiah. Missing the mark is sin. Torah is holy and just and good. Your response to the Torah decides whether or not you're holy and just and good. The Torah affords the opportunity to respond in obedience and righteousness, which produces life. Torah also affords the opportunity to reject and disobey. And let me tell you, you don't want to go there because that produces death. You choose. What shall you choose this day? I want to read something from Moses, Deuteronomy. He said, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. But... If your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, Moses says, I declare to you today that you will surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land when you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. And then he says, I call heaven and earth to be a witness against you, that I've set before you life and death the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. How? By loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord your God swore to your fathers, to Avraham, to Yitzchak, to Yaakov. And listen, couched within that, do you want to live in the land, is this picture of eternity. He said that those who sinned against me those 40 years will not enter my rest. Second Timothy. Paul wrote this to Timothy. Listen to what he said. Chapter 3, verse 16. He said, all scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for restoration for restoration, for training in righteousness, so that the person belonging to God may be capable, fully equipped for every good deed. God breathed all Scripture, and therefore all Scripture breathed by God is valuable. Every verse in the Bible, hear me, every word in the Torah, the entire Tanakh is inspired by God, suitable for teaching, for reproof, for restoration and training in righteousness. And everyone who belongs to God and allows Scripture to shepherd them in these four very important areas will be fully equipped and capable for every good deed. You still out there? Amen? All Scripture, hear me, to suggest that we are to unhitch ourselves from the worldview, the value system and regulations of the Jewish scriptures, and that the apostles unhitch the Christian faith from the Jewish scriptures is not only tragically unsound and unscriptural, but it misses the elephant in the room. It smacks of replacement theology. It does more than smack. It declares replacement theology that God has taken these promises and these covenants and he's moved them to somebody else because somehow the Jewish people aren't worthy anymore. As if God changes his mind like a man. Hear me. 
One cannot divorce the Jewish people or their values from the Scripture. It doesn't work that way. Yes, even the New Testament. Amen? They were given to us by the Jewish people. Newsflash, Jesus was a Jew. Hallelujah. Sometimes I just feel like preaching. You know, you get that little hop going, right? <laughs> Hear me. I, I'm going to keep going on this line. The Torah is righteous and holy and good because it leads you to the goal of the Torah, which is who? Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah. Hear me. It is a transgression of the Torah itself not to see the Messiah in the Torah. And I realize what I'm saying. I mean that. That is the point of the book. Remember the Bereans? He said, Paul, come on back. Paul opens the Torah scrolls and he starts teaching about Yeshua from the Torah scrolls. Come back tomorrow. The folks in Thessalonica, not so much. Get out of town, right? Righteousness is found in Messiah Yeshua. Jumping ahead real quick, almost done. Romans chapter 10, Paul says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That's misleading. Most translations will say Messiah is the end. Hear me, bad, bad, bad translation. Not good. The Greek word translated as end is telos. It means goal. It's where we get telephone and telecommunications and telescope. The goal, it's best understood. A telescope is pointed at a specific goal, a heavenly body that you want to observe or study. When I dial a number on my phone, I have a specific goal in mind, the other person at the other end. Likewise, the Torah has a specific goal of pointing us toward righteousness in the person of Messiah Yeshua. Now, I don't say this very often, but I'm going to say it tonight. If you have end in your Bible, cross it out. Oh, you didn't say that. Yeah, I did. It's incorrect. Goal. It's best understood as goal. And I've added some clarity. Bring up a verse. For Messiah is the goal of the Torah for observing the divine laws and keeping God's commandments to everyone who believes. That makes better sense to me. How about you? Amen. <laughs> a couple of you. Good. I'll take two. Makes sense? We're good? Okay. Well, that, that's as far as I plan to go tonight. Um, but I do want to encourage you and uh, you know, have you be thinking about Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. It's just around the corner. If you have Jewish friends, invite them. It doesn't cost anything to come to our, our services. So invite them. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, pray for the salvation, that, that our Jewish brothers and sisters would, would, would begin to study the Torah and see the Messiah, and that our Christian friends would begin to study the, the Torah and see that it has value in the life of the believer, that we don't need to unhitch from them. Um, so I, I just want you to be in preparation um, as we approach these very, very wonderful times. Us believers... It's just like, it's like icing on the cake, right? But there's still a very serious time for us to consider, for introspection, for self-evaluation. And so I encourage you to be in prayer and to be prayerful in the things that God would have you do. Got a deal? Yeah. Father, thank you for this time together. Even, even in these days of uncertainty, when pestilence seems to be sweeping the entire earth, um, we follow you because you're the Messiah. We trust you. We ask that you would heal our land, that you would take this disease away. But, Father, you're also warning us to look up. Um, so, Father, help us to do that. Help us to look at ourselves, at our lives. Keep my brothers and sisters safe in this room. Help them to be safe. I encourage safe behavior. But, Father, more than that, I ask that you would be with them and bless them, give them shalom, shalom, and be kind to them. 
we pray and say this to a God who has ears and a mouth and eyes and he sees. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Would you please stand with me? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Ya'er Adonai panavelecha vichuneka Isa Adonai panavelecha ve'yasem lecha Shalom, shalom, shalom Shabbat Shalom, 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 Shabbat Shalom. From work day to Sabbath, from labor to rest, we honor this day you especially blessed. Go with us and guide us and help us to be vessels that you your spirit of peace shalom shalom shabbat shalom 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 shabbat shalom go in the peace of messiah